早上好。I thought I'd scare the people who came here from the Latin America program <laughs> thinking that they're going to talk Chinese. Hi there. My name is Jennifer Turner, and I direct the China Environment Forum here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I'm very excited today to welcome you to a meeting that's co-sponsored by my project, the China Environment Forum, and the Latin America program. Um, I think Cindy Arnson, the director, she'll be popping right back in in a moment. But yeah, I actually, I don't co-sponsor much with them. But I have a feeling that this is going to change. And the reason I have a feeling that this is going to change is because of these people here. The topic that we're talking about today, about Chinese investment in Latin America, which is why Cindy and I are going to be doing more meetings together, because it's a trend that doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. And it's one, as our, our speakers today will be talking about how this boom in investment, particularly in the energy and mining sectors, is creating kind of a new wave of environmental degradation, social conflict. And, you know, and, I, and when I talked with the Kevin and the speakers here, I think they kind of, we didn't, they kind of promised me we're not going to be all gloom and doom because there are some positive signs of how Latin American governments and Chinese companies are trying to work together to mitigate some of these challenges. So, right, not all gloom and doom people, just want to confirm, because we don't want total depression. Um, and... Um, I already, I already mentioned you, so you know. And, and then we're going to start out with uh, Kevin Gallagher, who's a visiting scholar in the International Development Program at Syce Johns Hopkins. And he's on leave as a professor of global development at Boston University, where we've already discussed he's probably happy he was here rather than in Boston, where it's still probably snow up there. Um, he co-directs the Global Economic Governance Initiative. And he's going to start off the talk today kind of introducing the report that was published. It's out on the table. Grab it quick. It's going like hotcakes. Um, focuses on China and Latin America. And it was put together by the Working Group on Development and Environment in the Americas. And he's going to be followed by Cynthia Sanborn, who directs the Research Center at University of the Pacific in Lima, Peru. And she's, going, she's a member of the National Working Group on Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. She'll be talking a wee bit about that in her presentation. Um, her talk is going to focus a little bit more on the mining and extractive industry. And um, next, last, but well, kind of last, we'll, we'll be circling around. I think there may be ping pong as this presentation moves forward. Um, next will be Rebecca Ray, who's a research fellow at Boston University Global Economic Governance Initiative. She coordinates this working group, writing as well as keeping people in line, I'm sure. And uh, she's a PhD student in economics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. She still has snow on her driveway. And she's going to be talking about oil issues. And um, oh, I did, did want to note, I forgot to mention that, that Cynthia Zamborn, she's a frequent <clears throat> participant here at the Wilson Center, and she <clears throat> co-authored the Peru study in a publication by the Latin America program, Reaching Across the Pacific. So I like short intros because I want them to talk. And your job today, listen attentively, think of difficult questions because this crew can handle it. Can you handle it? We can handle it. You can handle it. All right. Did you, you've given him the clicker, so he's now in charge, which could be dangerous. I got and, the, okay. I it's got you, Kevin. Is this on? Can everyone hear me? Yep, everyone can hear you. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction, and thanks everybody for coming here. When we uh, when we saw when we said, well, we're, you know, what's the think tank we want to approach to do the public launch of this stuff? Uh, we thought of the Woodrow Wilson Center first. There's lots of places in town that have uh, Latin America groups, and there's a growing number of places in town that are starting to have China groups. But uh, this place is the only place that's had a China environment group uh, well before it was even a big issue in China. We're 15 well years old. Sexy. Um, and now you can't be a serious shop in this town without, uh, without having people who think about this stuff. And so uh, they've done an incredible job of bringing all you interesting people together. Let's hope we can do a good job of delivering something to talk about. Uh, what we're here to talk about is our new report called China and Latin America, Lessons for South-South Cooperation and Sustainable Development. It's a two, the result of a two-year collaborative multi-university <coughs> research project funded by the Charles Stewart Mon Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. Um, and the coordinators, in addition to my group at Boston University, the Global Economic Governance Initiative, is the uh, Center for uh, Centro de Investigación at the Universidad de Pacifica, the Center for Economic Transformation out of the Economics Department at the University of Buenos Aires, and the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University. And the, uh, our four coordinating body bodies brought together a group of eight uh, in-country 
university-based or think tank-based research, researchers who did eight country studies. And uh, on the Woodrow Wilson Center webpage, there's a link to our webpage that has all the eight country studies, which are now available as of yesterday, and the, and the report. We've got the synthesis report out here. So each of these country study authors was asked, was asked to ask two questions. Question number one for the country that they were looking at was, to what extent is China an independent driver of social and environmental degradation or conflict in the region? Right? And to what extent is, Ch is China in, in, in any way a driver? And then secondly, each person or each group was asked to, uh, lots of Chinese companies have come into environmentally sensitive sectors in, in, the, in the region. And so folks did case studies on the extent to which Chinese firms behave any differently or perform any differently than their counterparts, uh, either other Western companies or some of the domestic companies. And our, our major findings, to cut to the chase here, are the f these four. First, that China uh, has been an independent and significant driver of social and environmental degradation in the region. But to be clear, it's not because China is making a conscious effort to uh, degrade the environment. China's growth miracle has been uh, responsible for a global super cycle of commodities that uh, made commodities surge and really lifted Latin American economic development or economic growth over the past 10 to 12 years. Uh, it just so happens that in Latin America, the extraction of primary commodities is endemic to environmental degradation and social conflict. The second finding is that when Chinese companies have come to Latin America in these environmental sensitive sectors, they've been, they've been quite challenged. Uh, Peruvian, we'll hear today about Peruvian iron ore companies are really uh, clashed with local unions and local communities in Peru. Uh, we'll learn about how Colombian oil, uh, uh, Chinese oil companies in Colombia struggled to uh, meet uh, environmental regulations and clash with civil society around that. Um, however, Chinese firms have shown that, that they can actually meet and beat local standards and sometimes perform better than their Western counterparts in Latin America. Uh, we'll hear about how in Ecuador, Chinese oil companies um, have a much better track record with engaging with uh, local communities and indigenous groups um, than, and, and a much better track, re track record when it comes to adhering to environmental regulations than some of the egregious uh, U.S.-based companies that have been in the same areas uh, for a long period of time. And we'll also hear about how per, uh, Chinese, Chinese companies in Peru are among the first uh, members of the uh, extractive, extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, even though their, their home, uh, their at headquarters, the, the same companies haven't engaged on, on a global level. So that's some, some good news and some bad news. What we're really concerned about now uh, is you know, what we find in our, pay, in our work is that the boom, but now the bust, or the real slowdown in Latin America, is, putting, is emboldening interest groups to put real downward pressure on social and environmental standards in, in the region at exactly the long, wrong time. And at the end of the presentation, we'll give some policy recommendations on how to deal with all this. So here's a quick, quick picture of, uh, uh, of all the different country studies and the different uh, authors from different universities from around the region that did the different studies. Today, we're just going to be talking, going deep on a number of companies in Peru and, uh, and one company, one Sinopec, across uh, Colombia, Argentina, and Ecuador. But we're happy to answer questions about Chinese solar power in Chile. We're happy to answer questions about uh, soybeans in Brazil uh, and manufacturing in Mexico. E again, each one of these studies is, is on the web uh, that you can download the full, the full study. So let's go to that first research question. To what extent, uh, at the aggregate level, is China an independent driver of social and environmental change in the region? First, you need to understand the sort of hard economic numbers and the, and the, the general relationship. So if you look at this, uh, look at this table here, uh, in the, on, the, on your far left, you have Latin American exports to China over the past decade or so. And what you can see is almost 90% of them are concentrated in extractive industries and, um, uh, and in agriculture. Um, and that's starkly different, if you look at the middle bar, that's starkly different than the Latin American export profile to the rest of the world. Um, and it's also starkly different from what China imports from the rest of the world. So Latin America is a very strategic and very unique place for Chinese demand. And this demand um, has been in these hard and soft commodities that are, as I said, endemic to environmental degradation and social conflict. To cut, make my, sure my talk was close, 
uh, short. I don't have the table that's in the report if you have it here, but the, but the story about foreign direct investment, Chinese companies locating in Latin America, is basically the same. As a matter of fact, it's even more accentuated. The vast majority of Chinese foreign direct investment, which is the fastest growing in Latin America over the past decade, is in oil and gas and a little bit in mining as well. We maintain a database with the Inter-American Dialogue on Chinese policy bank bank loans to Latin American governments. And in between 2003 and 2014, uh, Chinese policy banks, the Export-Import Bank of China, the China Development Bank, and a handful of others uh, have lent upwards of $119 billion to Latin American governments. In 2014, that was more than the Inter-American Development Bank uh, and the World Bank combined. And if you look at this pie chart, uh, also it's very concentrated in extractive industries, soft commodities, and the infrastructure to enable uh, to enable uh, that kind of uh, trade and economic activity. Quick precision. Wait, because it's on. Sorry. It's okay. okay great. Just I quick, gather she can interrupt because it's I her. I will actually interrupt. I, no, no, because I've heard you use this figure, and yeah. I just want to make sure I'm clear on it. World Bank funding to Latin America, or the entire portfolio of the World, World Bank? World Bank to Latin America. And then, but the but the entire portfolio of yes. the IDB. Thank you. Yeah, we were at the IDB yesterday at a closed door meeting. We're happy to be matchmakers. Yesterday was one of the first ever meetings between the Environmental Safeguards Unit at the IDB and the Trade and Integration Unit, which is concerning. And it seems like today we're helping uh, the China and the Latin America group get together here. So and maybe fun. since we're and we can put this PowerPoint on our website yeah, too later. Ahead. So so you guys can you can you can kick back, you can watch, don't frantically take notes. Yeah, good. Keep going. So on a social level, uh, you, you know. Economic activity in this in this sector is what uh, Albert Hirschman referred to as enclave economies. These sectors have been responsible for growth in Latin America over the past 10 to 12 years, but they haven't been a big source of job creation. This graph here shows that the uh, job intensity of normal ec economic activity in the region over the period relative to export activity and export activity to China and Chinese export activity is among the least employment intensive uh, among their export basket. <clears throat> we spent a lot of time looking at the social and environmental impacts, and we were able to get very detailed data for all the countries in the region on greenhouse gas emissions and on water use. And when I say greenhouse gas emissions, I know you're, the picture you might have in your head is uh, a big smokestack or a big power plant somewhere. There's some of that, but the data that we're using looks at the carbon equivalent of a lot of greenhouse gas activity. And so even if you don't care about climate change, and Latin America has a lot more things to think about than climate change, the United States and China should be doing most of the work on that, uh, with the exception of some deforestation. But this, our indicators here are looking at deforestation, uh, looking at methane from cattle and so forth. And so this, if, if climate change isn't your thing, it's, it's ours uh, to a certain extent. Um, an indicator that looks at the carbon equivalent, the greenhouse gas emissions of all different kinds of economic activity also gives you a good idea of what's going on with land use change and, and so forth. And what we find is pretty, pretty concerning. Uh, if you look at the bar at the far left, the greenhouse gases are the, are the, are the yellow. And uh, exports to China are almost twice as large as the uh, greenhouse gas intensity of normal economic activity in the region. Water is even more concerning. It's almost three times as much uh, intensive in terms of water use than normal economic acti activity in Latin America. And since Chinese ex exports to China have been the fastest growing, this is a core reason why there's been so much environmental degradation. Chinese companies and Chinese banks that are engaged in the region operate with a lower level of social and environmental safeguards than their counterparts in the environmental uh, in the multilateral development banks, as you can see here with this table. Uh, not uh, not always are environmental impact assessments required. Not always are Chinese companies and banks engaging with uh, local and indigenous communities. Uh, often or sometimes these are uh, voluntary standards. And even though sometimes they're taken really seriously at home in Beijing, when you get down to the project level in countries, many of the operators there um, sometimes haven't even heard of them. Uh, that said, it should be noted that China actually has all these uh, these standards, at least on the books, well before the United States did, and well before many of the uh, many of the other development banks did. That said, <clears throat> there, what we find is that there's no uniform Chinese way of operating on these issues uh, in the region. 
while many of the Chinese firms have been challenged on these issues, there's many cases where Chinese companies, or some cases, I guess I should say, where Chinese companies have meet or beat standards, and they also perform better than their Western counterparts. In Bolivia, uh, on our, the, our, if you look at our Bolivia case study, the Bolivians have a law that is much stronger than the ILO 169 that requires uh, in, engagement with uh, with communities, um, and it's much stronger than what the IFC has. But uh, and in our case study, some communities completely rejected a Chinese tin mine. Um, but the Chinese were fine with that, and they found a community in an area that was much more uh, uh, much more suited for the plant, and they they complied with that, and they moved there, showing that they can they'll comply with regulations. In Ecuador, they uh, com comply with very strict. Uh, very progressive labor and contracting laws without any um, uh, without any pushback, and as I've said before, they have a much better record than Texaco and Chevron in the same areas that those companies uh, worked in before, and also perform better than Petro Petrobras. In Argentina and Mexico, uh, Chinese manufacturing firms and, and oil companies have had interesting joint ventures with Western firms, where they've learned uh, learned from the mistakes of the Western firms and uh, and have performed quite uh, quite interestingly. Uh, <clears throat> however, our biggest concern is that the biggest problems or the biggest challenges for China in the region uh, lie ahead of us. Uh, in January 8th and 9th of 2015 was the first CELAC China summit. China pledged to increase trade with Latin America to $500 billion over the next 10 years, pledged to increase foreign investment, foreign direct investment with the region to $250 billion over the next 10 years. And to prove that it just wasn't a press release, they uh, put together a family of uh, cooperation funds that could, could uh, be upwards of $35 billion for major infrastructure projects in the region. Uh, <clears throat> this is a map that shows uh, so the exi some of our case studies and some of the planned projects that are going to come out of this. One is a major transcontinental railway that will go from Lima to Sao Paulo, a number of others going into the Amazon. The diamonds here are mines, the triangles are dams, and we overlap many of these uh, projects um, with indigenous communities that are in uh, gold line and obviously the green are different levels of uh, agreed upon uh, biodiversity hotspots by scientists around the world. <clears throat> the Chinese record that's been fairly good to date have been in areas where there's been mergers and acquisitions, so they're actually taking over an existing plant, where now they're moving into new greenfield projects, which is obviously much more challenging. And the other big challenge that I'll note before I hand it over to Cynthia, that I foreshadowed earlier is that there's now a real increased pressure on governments, not actually not by Chinese companies, but by um, <clears throat> by these sectors in general to put downward pressure on social and environmental regulations as the region is starting to slow down economically and trying to do whatever they can to get what little foreign direct investment is available. We'll hear that Peru is uh, maybe rolling back some of the big strides that it's made recently. Uh, the, in Brazil, the rural Easter class is uh, continuously putting downward pressure on efforts to limit deforestation. In Bolivia, they almost passed a mining law that would have robbed the ability of the environmental ministry to take a part in project approval, but luckily civil society organizations pushed back and made that now happen. <clears throat> so our, in our, it, when we get towards the end, we'll talk about how the, for social and environmental reasons to stay in office uh, and to make sure you've got long-term economic prosperity. These are the right things for Latin American governments to be taken care of first and foremost. It's their resources, it's their, eco their, their economies, but there's also a role for China, Chinese firms and the Chinese government to play as well, which we'll talk about moving on. Let me pass it on and we can learn more in-depthly about uh, Peru. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Jennifer and Cynthia and, and all of you for hosting us here. It is very exciting to be with people who know uh, a lot about these issues and about the different pieces that we're trying to put together in our, in our various case studies. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, Chinese investment in mining in Peru, but in the case studies that are on the website, we also are looking at Bolivia and Colombia in the, in the mining sector, as well as um, gas and oil that uh, Becky will talk about later. Um, I think it's not a mystery to those who um, work on Latin America that, that Peru has experienced in the last 20 years a, a real 
no notorious and amazing revival and expansion of its mining industry. Peru is historically a natural resource exporting country, but the mining industry was in deep uh, trouble and paralysis in the 80s, but in the early 90s, Peru privatized all of the industry and aggressively promoted new foreign investment. Um, and in this period, the, not only has mining become a, a very important part of the overall Peruvian economy and the national treasury um, and the growth record that it's had, um, but the physical expansion and the interactions that come with that nationwide has led to also a serious rise in social conflict. And really the leading cause of, of violent social conflict in Peru today is also related to expansion of the mining industry. So that's really two sides to this picture. Um, and in this context, when, when, uh, when Kevin came to talk to us, we were already wrestling with this question, and Cynthia knows about this from some past relations, whether, um, does it make a difference if this ex investment is Chinese or Brazilian or, or wherever, and, and why do we, you know, why are we concerned about it? Um, I would say that uh, China is a major part of this story. Um, it's the major market for Peru's minerals, uh, and it's the major number one investing country in the mining sector now, although a lot of other companies and countries are there. China is about 33% of the projected mining portfolio in the next 10 years in Peru, and some very significant projects on the, on the board. Uh, there are a number of major projects in the phases of, of um, exploration or getting environmental impact assessments approved or in construction. There are two operating mines now that are owned by the Chinese. Um, and does it make a difference? And I guess the, the answer to that, that that led us to being interested in this research is, well, if you have a context in which you have a state that has been largely absent in most of the regions where this mining has taken place, and if you have governments that have been very lax about implementing and enforcing rules that are on the books, because Peru has, has made great efforts to... Um, reform, we call extractive governance reform, to, impo to implement a series of measures to try to avoid some of the real boom and bust and negative impacts of the past of, of previous mining booms. Um, but if in practice on the ground the government isn't implementing um, or isn't, isn't present, and in practice m until very recently um, mining investors were really kind of tossed out there to deal with communities and to, to, to establish community relations, develop their projects without much supervision from government, then then maybe it does make sense to ask, well, if the companies are on their own in many parts of the country, um, do the Chinese companies operate any differently? Does their past experience prepare them better or worse for dealing with communities, indigenous communities in the highlands of Peru? Um, if does the, the, the more lax environmental regulation at home mean that the practices in a country like Peru will be that way as well? And so we went into this really asking those kind of questions, um, very aware of what Kevin said, that the drive to make to revive mining as a motor of development was a Peruvian one and was initiated by Peruvian policymakers, not by the Chinese investors. Um, in our in our study, we, we look at um, there's like 14 different Chinese companies operating in different um, parts of the Peru in, in mining. We looked at three cases more in depth, and because they represent sort of three very different experiences, and one of the issues we underscore is the diversity of experiences. We look at uh, the Rio Blanco project, a huge copper project on the border between Peru and Ecuador that is simply not taking off because of a series of, of, of challenges that the Chinese company has you know, came into and was not able to overcome. The Toromocho copper mine, which is a, a project that's just up and running in December of 2014, a huge mine, uh, begun in 2007 by the Chinese, and the Marco iron mine um, operated by Shogang. And uh, I wanted to stress that with me in this research has been Victoria Chong, who's a, um, a young researcher at our center, now getting a PhD at USC. And she is an experienced in Chinese, she's a Peruvian Chinese woman who's experienced on the Chinese side as well. So it's really a joint project. Um, and I, one of the things I wanted to, to discuss in the time that I have is that we looked at five different types of what we call extractive governance reforms, or efforts by different levels of policymaking in Peru to regulate uh, and govern better the, the, the extraction of natural resources or the, some of the effects related to them. And we looked at, these are things we're looking at in general in our research center, but we tried to look at how the Chinese companies um, line up compared to the others in the industry. And I'll briefly mention uh, these areas of reform that we've looked at. Uh, the first one was, as, as was mentioned, revenue transparency and distribution. Peru has made enormous strides um, 50% of the income taxes generated by the mining industry are now redistributed to the local, municipal, and regional uh, governments 
uh, where the mining operations are located. This is a, a major step, the mining canon. Uh, and Peru has also tried to make more transparent both the, the way the deals that are negotiated, the investment commitments, and where how much is paid and where it goes. Peru was the first country in the Americas to join the EITI. Um, it's a voluntary initiative, a global one, in 2005, and the first compliant country in all of the Americas in 2011, with these relatively high standards for revenue transparency. Mm. Um, Chinese firms in Peru did not engage with this initiative when they uh, were asked to in the beginning, 2005, 2007, I joined it. Uh, at first there was no answer, and then for several years the answer was, gee, we really should, but our home companies won't authorize it. And finally, after talking to them for a number of years, last year, four, four Chinese companies operating in Peru, important ones, uh, agreed to join. This is a, an annual kind of a study by an independent accounting firm of sort of publish what you pay initiative. And they're engaged at this year. You know, so we can't say that this is a long-standing commitment, but it's a real big step. And I think it was a tribute to the Peruvian working group and the Peruvian um, government to really encourage them to do so even though their home countries are not part of this initiative. Their home companies are not part of this initiative yet globally with the exception of MMG as one company that is. Um, a second area we looked at was voluntary social investment. Uh, China, it, mining companies have been encouraged by uh, several governments in Peru and given a lot of incentives to invest it voluntarily in their areas of influence, uh, under, the, under the previous Peruvian government, this was in lieu of slapping uh, windfall profit tax on them. So they're basically told you either you either voluntarily invest a certain amount or we're going to tax you. Um, and uh, Shogang is the only company that <coughs> is engaged in this major voluntary project that the government promoted, and their level of investment was proportionate to what they committed to. It was, they, they basically signed a commitment to invest in their area of influence and have done so. However, looking across the board, the Chinese mining firms operating in Peru today, we find are really investing in similar amounts and types of activities to other um, non-Chinese firms, and in some cases more, and, and often related to the cost of relocation of communities and, and investing in creating new homes and new environments for them to live in. Um, but, but on that level, they're really right at, on par with the industry. Uh, although one of the cases we looked at um, They've made enormous efforts to invest in an area where the people really don't want to mine and they're not getting, the money isn't buying that compliance, so it doesn't always work without other things. A uh, third area we looked at was participation in different multi-stakeholder fora. Uh, because of the level of conflictiveness associated with mining in different parts of the country, there's been an effort to, to create what are called dialogue tables in which um, people from civil society, local authorities, peasant communities, company officials, government officials sit around a table and try to negotiate uh, and try to address the needs of different members or at least dialogue with each other. At least these happen after a project is up and running. It's not the same as the ILO 169 prior consultation. Um, and there's a national group called the, the, the Mining Dialogue Group as well that meets about once a month to discuss among um, all kinds of contenders issues of particularly high level of sensitivity or conflict. The Chinese companies have not been uh, engaged in any of the national level activity. Um, there have been much more low, low profile, much more difficult, uh, difficulty in communicating, not wanting to go on the record to, to national media or in, or in these kind of high profile activities. But on the ground, they're now engaged in four different um, local dialogue tables in which they have in significant investments. And although some of them we've talked to were reluctant to get involved, feeling that for example, local community demands are often related to the ability of local authorities to address them. They finally realize that they have to be at the table, and, and that's, that's an important change as well. Um, an issue that's raised a lot of attention around the world has been labor rights. In Peru, there's a great deal of fear that the Chinese companies wouldn't respect what is a long tradition of respecting labor rights in the formal sector in Peru. And mine workers in Peru have a historically very important and very militant trade union tradition. Mine workers have been fundamental to the history of the labor movement in Peru and to the history of the left as well. Um, most of the Chinese firms operating in Peru still have very small workforces. They're not fully in operation yet, so it's not fair to compare all of them with more longstanding operations. Um, but we did see, we did find, in, in, kind of across the board, Chinese mining company executives. Uh, really hard to accept and 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 get accustomed to the kind of trade union tradition that Peru has, including, you know, you have to pay your labor leaders to do labor organizing, and you know, you have to f the companies have to fund them and give them license. Um, the demands for profit sharing and other things that come with the mining industry, it took them some time to come around. Um, 
since 2001, I, was, I want to say that in the 1990s, when, when, the, when the major company Shogang began, the Fujimori administration that encouraged them to come was also trying to really undermine and weaken trade unions. So they came into a context in which it was okay to sort of play hardline with your unions. Since 2001, that, that hasn't been so much the case. And the Chinese companies have been given considerable scrutiny in terms of their labor practices. The media is on to this. The unions are on to this. And um, looking across the board, for example, we find now that Chinese companies are operating with far fewer tertiary workers than the rest of the industry. There's a tendency to hire people off the books or hire people for um, kind of tertiary services and then abuse that and keep them on for a long time. And therefore, they don't get the labor benefits that the formal workers in the industry get. And the Chinese companies have far more workers on the books with full benefits and full profit sharing. Um, their majority of workers being hired are Peruvian. The Chinese companies, after one unfortunate experience, are not hiring a lot of Chinese workers. They're hiring local workers. Um, although Shugang as a company stands out for having an ongoing conflictive relationship with their union, although there seems to be some effort to improve that in recent years. The final area that we looked at was environmental regulation, which is a, a key one. And as Kevin said, it's an area of major contention in general in the region, and Peru is a country right now going through tremendous tension and pushback from the mining industry. Peru is a country that did not have strong autonomous environmental regulatory agencies. The period of privatization and, ex and expansion of investment in the 90s was not accompanied by really strong uh, institutions to assure that environmental standards on the books were respected. Peru created a Ministry of the Environment in 2008 and a regulatory organ within that called the OEFA even more recently, wh who's charged with supervising operations of different kinds of activities around the country and giving warnings or sanctions when, when uh, standards are violated. Uh, but the Ministry of Energy and Mines has hung on to the approval of environmental impacts assessments and doesn't want to give that up. Well, in a context in which there's a, a lot of pushing back and forth with policymakers trying to regulate these industries better, with a lot of NGO and, and transnational civil society activity, but with the mining industry uh, pushing back in many ways, we find the Chinese firms are being more compli <coughs> compliant than contestatory. The Chinese firms have not been the ones that have gone on the books claiming that environmental regulation is just a hassle that prevents investments from getting on the board. The Chinese companies have been respecting the rules for the most part. Chinalco, in just a month into its operations in late 2014, had a very unfortunate acid water runoff spill. Um, it, it, the holding area broke down with heavy rains. Um, what struck us was the uh, OEFA, the, the Peruvian Environmental Regulatory Organ, was on to them immediately and had them halt operations. And the company immediately responded and halted operations and fixed the problem. And so while it's unfortunate that there was a spill, this happens a lot in this industry, and what we found was that on both sides the, the response was appropriate. And as a result of that also, the Association of Chinese Companies operating in Peru, um, in which the mining companies are all active members, uh, so went to the environmental ministry and sought it to organize informational workshop with their with all of their members so that they all understand better how the how the rules work, which has not been necessarily the attitude of some of the prominent political spokesmen for the Peruvian mining industry who sort of just don't like this stuff. So, so we've also found that the Chinese um, behavior in that area was, was on the most part um, positive. And if we look at, fi at fines on mining companies for environmental um, <coughs> issues of various sorts, we find the, the Chinese companies sort of in the middle. Now, some of that is because some are, are more new, like Chinalco. Rio Blanco Zijin has had problems in even in the pre-construction phase, Shugang is really in the middle. So by far, the biggest violators, if you'll note it on the list, are uh, U.S. firms, starting with, with Do Run and, and uh, Yanacocha. Um, and I, how much time do I have? A few minutes? You're good. Okay. Uh, we, I wanted to mention two cases that we've looked at across the board in more depth, because they really are kind of two extreme situations in a broader picture of diversity of firm experiences in Peru. Um, but they're also moving pictures, both of them. Neither of them are sort of set in their ways. Um, and the first one is Shugang, as I mentioned, and one that probably is the most notorious and often cited um, around the world. Uh, Shugang actually um, purchased a company that was founded by uh, Americans, US investors in the 1950s, Marcona Mining Company. It was nationalized by the military government in 75, privatized in 92. And this was the first 
Peruvian mining company put on the block by the Fujimori administration, and it was the first Chinese overseas mining investment in South America. So it was a real experiment on both sides. Um, it initially had real difficulties with its workers. It inherited a, a very militant trade union with a lot of experience. Um, the Peruvian government laid off hundreds of workers from the company before they put it on the block, but um, they were still in company housing, and the Chinese company came in and evicted them. Uh, creating great animosity in the town of Marcona, which basically lives off this firm. They brought in a couple hundred Chinese workers. Those workers were not welcome and had to leave very quickly, and, and no other company tried that afterwards. Uh, and they took, as I said in the 90s, a very hard line on, on, on labor activity and um, had annual strikes around collective bargaining on wages that many other firms had learned to negotiate peacefully without the strike activity. Um, I think the encouragement to take a hard line came not only from within the company and perhaps its headquarters, but also from the administration, the Peruvian administration in the 90s that had that attitude as well. Um, Shogang also um, reneged or, or fell back on its initial investment commitment. Um, the privatization of the mining industry was supposed to come with huge amounts of investment to modernize plants and to make the industry run better. Uh, and they had committed to something that by 1995, which was their deadline, they could not meet. And, and part of that was due to troubles at home in the in the home company, as far as we understand. Um, and they paid a modest fine rather than investment. So they also um, generate a great deal of animosity for that. Uh, they've had ongoing conflicts with the local community that depends on the company. They uh, own and operate the water services and the electrical services for the community. And most of the people in the community work for the company. The, the only port in Marcona is operated by the company as well, so fishermen have to deal with them on port operations. Um, so it's been a real sort of um, tense situation over the years. However, we find uh, with the transition of government in Peru to a more democratic administration after 2000, it's also been one of the most scrutinized and criticized firms in Peru, and you have labor inspectors and, and others on them constantly since 2001. And in fact, they have subsequently invested significantly in modernizing the plants and the operations. They are in the process of trying to turn the uh, water services over to the municipality, and that's actually been problematic. The municipality doesn't feel entirely ready to, to do that. Since 2013, they have been in a um, dialogue roundtable with different stakeholders in Marcona and local government officials trying to resolve in a more long-term fashion some of these, these problems that have been ongoing. Um, so it's a case in which we see positive developments in recent years. We know that the Chinese embassy in Peru and the Chinese government has, I think, leaned harder on the company because it's, a, it's, it's the image of, of the country under stake. Uh, but it is a case we look at as, as sort of doing things wrong. Now, it took 15 more years in Peru till other <coughs> Chinese companies came in and invested in the sector. And in those 15 years, a lot had changed in Peru. And when companies like Chinalco came in after 2007, um, one of the things their executives told us was they wanted to avoid all the mistakes that Shogang had made. And they really tried to learn from other people's mistakes. Also, Newmont and Yanacocha, which has had a, a very conflictive relationship with its community. And the executives hired by Chinalco were really much more concerned with doing things right. And um, it's a huge project in which an entire mountain is going to be felled in order to create a large copper mine. The mine is expected to pr provide around 18% of China's total copper needs, so it's a huge project. Um, and everything indicates that they've tried to do it all by the books, not only being productive and profitable, but also a model of corporate social responsibility for China. The workers for Chinalco has hired have so far been almost entirely Peruvian, with the exception of a few executives. All indicates that they're paying top wages and, in fact, attracting labor from other companies in the area um, that don't pay so well. <laughs> and um, perhaps what they're best known for is this major community relocation effort. They had to move the town of, Mo of Morococha, uh, 5,000 people, um, from old Morococha, which was a mining camp, very polluted, very old, very rundown, poor services, to new Morococha, which is a town that they entirely constructed from scratch. Although many would say objectively that the living conditions in the new town are far better than the old one, people have new homes, you know, water, electricity, churches, schools, etc. Um, and Chinalco has invested uh, over $50 million in just getting this town up and running. It was nonetheless traumatic for people. And for anybody to move is traumatic. And mining involves usually moving people and taking away their land and, and, and building over it. The process was a very consultation process. It was very participatory. Most of the people in Morococha um, 
were involved and engaged in the nature of the move and where they were going. There's a very small group, about 300 people holding out that don't want to move. Um, and they're being treated, I think, with respect. They're not being forcibly moved yet, um, although we'll see. But for the most part, it was an exemplary process for what is Peru's history, in which people are usually ripped of their land and moved without any kind of respect. So this is an interesting case as well. And as I said, the reaction to the first um, spill that they had, we th I think, was, was fairly um, rapid and, and recognizing that they need to do a better job in, in that area and to be on top of things. Um, so I'll leave it there. I just wanted to stress that the diversity of experiences in Peru um, is important. <laughs> the learning from previous experiences, both Chinese and others, is important for the new investors that are coming in. Uh, but also a, a message of our project overall is the fundamental ability of um, proving local and national authorities to demand the same kind of standards of all companies in the industry. And that's something that we need to really focus on as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here, everyone. It's great to see such a full house this morning. My name is Rebecca Ray, and I'm going to speak about what we can learn from the three oil case studies in our project. I'm specifically going to focus on Ecuador, which is the case study that my co-author Adam Kimianti and I wrote together. First, I'm going to talk about one Chinese oil company in particular, Sinopec. It's one of the three big state-owned enterprises in petroleum from China. We tracked its performance through three different countries in the region, through Argentina, Ecuador, and Colombia. And what we found was that Sinopec had very different levels of, of environmental and social performance in these three different countries. There's no one Sinopec standard across the board. Instead, it varied based on the policy and regulatory <laughs> environments that they were operating in. This is really good news and also bad news for Latin American governments and civil societies because what we found shows us that if you're a Latin American government and your constituency is pushing particular policy priorities, be they environmental or labor or community related, even if they're unusual for Sinopec, they will, if you set these standards, communicate them clearly <coughs> and enforce them thoroughly, Sinopec will comply, often better than their Western counterparts. The bad news is that if you don't, there's no reason to believe that Sinopec will live up to a high standard out of the goodness of their hearts. They are an oil company. I'm going to start by talking about Colombia. Here's a map of Colombia. All of the little dots on this map are Chinese-run oil concessions. The ones run by Sinopec specifically are the red ones, which I've circled out here. Now, as you can see, it's not, they're not in particularly sensitive territory. They're not in this orange, the gold-striped indigenous territory in the southeast. They're not on the pastel-colored biodiversity hotspots or the Amazon. But Sinopec has still managed to run into tremendous difficulty with local communities on environmental and labor performance. In each of these situations, the Colombian government bears significant responsibility for allowing the situation to get to this point. First, if we look at the labor situation, Sinopec hires all of its workers through local community action boards who are in charge of finding, interviewing, and sending on all of the job candidates. This is not an uncommon practice for that area, but there have been rampant allegations of abuse, of fraud, of corruption, of bringing in candidates from elsewhere in the country who are willing to pay for a spot. Now, the national government, to its credit, has tried to rein in the hiring power that these local community action boards have, but it hasn't been able to overcome these local powerful groups. So unfortunately, this dispute continues to this day. Environmentally, Sinopec has run into serious difficulties with local community groups over a relatively small half million dollar conservation project that it committed to five years ago in 2010. It still to this date has not fulfilled that commitment and it was sued recently by a local community group and it went all the way up to the Inspector General, the National Inspector General's office who sided with the community group, who cited Sinopec for never having fulfilled that responsibility that they promised. But the same finding also cited the Colombian national government. It also cited the National Environmental Licensing Agency for never having held them accountable, never having insisted over these last five years that they live up to their responsibility and their commitment. So you see, in both of these situations, Sinopec's performance has been, we well, might say, not up to par. But that responsibility is really shared between Sinopec and the national government's ability to get better performance from them.
if we move on to Argentina, this is similar to the previous map of Colombia. You've got your biodiversity hotspots up at the top in the north, and the little spots that you see throughout the map are Chinese-run oil concessions. Mo the red ones are Sinopec, again, and you'll notice that most of them are concentrated in the southern province of Santa Cruz. Now, in Argentina, all of the uh, negotiations surrounding oil concessions are conducted at the province level. All of their commitments regarding environmental and labor performance, other than a few basic environmental standards like water contamination rules at the national level, all of these things are negotiated at the province level. This definitely has some drawbacks in that province level royalties are on the table at, together with environmental and labor standards. So they could be used against each other or traded off. But in Sinopec's situation, this has really worked to the benefit of both the community and the, the company. And the reason for that, we believe, is that Santa Cruz is so remote. It's so far away from Buenos Aires that if the negotiations were happening all the way up here in Buenos Aires, actually, imagine how difficult it would be for local environmental groups, for local community groups to get their concerns heard at that negotiating table, especially if royalties are on the table with these other concerns. And in terms of enforcement, the people who are enforcing these agreements are the people who live in these local communities because it's done at the province level. So this has had really, this, this has meant much more heightened scrutiny, much more accountability for Sinopec than what we see in Colombia. And Sinopec has lived up to it, has brought its performance up to meet that scrutiny. If we look at their labor standards, for example, in Santa Cruz, what the provincial authorities care about is that laborers come from Santa Cruz. It's on the books that all oil companies have to have, their, have, to have, their, their workers have to have had residency in Santa Cruz for two years before they begin work. And Sinopec has lived up to the standard. They have performed. When it comes to pollution, Santa Cruz's priority is that every time a lease is renewed, there must be an audit of contamination from that oil company, and there must be a five-year plan for remediating it. And Sinopec has lived up to that standard and has complied. When it comes to natural resources, water, for example, Sinopec inherited its concession from Oxy, from Occidental. And with it, they inherited a commitment to build wells and aqueducts in the region to prevent water use from becoming the spark of conflict between themselves and local communities. And they did live up to that, to that obligation, but only after there was a great deal of public scrutiny, actually, in this last year, when they were behind schedule in the construction of those aqueducts when a massive drought hit. So again, where there's accountability, where there's scrutiny, Sinopec has lived up to that standard. Finally, I want to talk about Ecuador. Now, this map looks a little different from the last two maps that I've shown you. Instead of showing, if I were to show you biodiversity hotspots in Ecuador, it would cover the entire map, right? The entire country is either a biodiversity hotspot or the Amazon. So instead, it shows varying degrees of biodiversity, the most important areas for biodiversity, the highest level of biodiversity in the whole continent is found in eastern Ecuador. Now, these blue areas that are filled, there, there are two types of blue areas that you'll see on the map. There's filled in and then there's this hollow spot down here. The filled in blue areas are concessions that Sinopec has had in a joint venture with CNPC, the China National Petroleum Company, another state-owned petroleum company from China. Now, the northern one is by a joint venture that those two Chinese companies have called Andes Petroleum. And the one in the middle is another joint venture from those two Chinese SOEs called Petro Oriental. The hollow one is a new concession that Andes Petroleum just got last year. Work has not begun on it yet. Now, in the two existing concessions, the Chinese companies have had a better relationship with local communities. We went back and looked at every protest that made the news in Ecuador anywhere for any reason since 2006, since those oil companies arrived. And uh, Andes Petroleum and Petro Oriental have better records of community relations, fewer protests, and much less severe conflicts than any other major oil companies in the country. The best by far, including the local state-owned enterprises, the local government-owned uh, oil companies. So 
how did they accomplish this? This is not only the best record that Sinopec has throughout the region, but it's the best record that oil companies have had in Ecuador. And there's a few reasons why they've been able to come up to this standard. One of them is, uh, and I think Cynthia explained this really well when she was talking about labor issues, there's a tradition of being able to circumvent labor law by hiring workers on indirectly as contractors, subcontracted laborers, tertiary workers, they're called. Ecuador's uh, limited tertiary workers severely. They uh, only allow in oil fields, in oil concessions, tertiary workers in what are called supplementary services, things like security or catering for the cafeteria, nothing actually involving being in the oil field. So you never have a situation where there's a spark of social conflict because there's two oil workers in the oil field, one of whom's direct, working right next to one who's a temp worker, for example. That doesn't happen. Also, they have very strict rules in the oil sector specifically about local workers. 95% of manual workers and 90% of managerial workers even have to be Ecuadorian. And when I was talking to a contact at the Chinese embassy in Quito and I asked him, what do you attribute this more positive community relationship that these concessions have had? What do you attribute it to? He said, it's very unusual for Chinese investors in Ecuador to hire so many Ecuadorian workers. That's very unusual, but we do it because that's what the Ecuadorian government requires, and that has bought us peace and good relationships with the communities. Secondly, when it comes to inner environmental performance, they may be getting off a little easy here because some of these concessions that they have are some of the first areas where oil was ever explored for and drilled in Ecuador. These are some of the areas that Texaco first drilled decades ago. And when my co-author, Adam Kimienti, was speaking to indigenous leaders up here in the northern concession area, that they told him is that we lost that battle decades ago. We haven't been able to pursue traditional livelihoods on this territory for so many years. We go outside of this territory to hunt and fish when we need to do it. So that is not something that's going to spark our conflict with Andes Petroleum because that was our conflict years ago with their predecessors, and it's not an issue anymore, unfortunately. Now, um, oh, one more thing. So I want to talk now about the new concession that Andes Petroleum just got in this hollow area here that you see. And it's our belief that this concession is not going to go nearly as smoothly as the previous concessions that they have. And it's not necessarily because of Sinopec or CNPC, Andes Petroleum's performance per se, it's because of Ecuador not living up to their own standards environmentally and socially. As you can see, the new concession is in very sensitive areas. It's in the most, one of the most biodiverse areas in the country, and it's also on top of indigenous territory. There's two indigenous groups that live there, the Sapara and the Quichua. Oil has never been drilled there before. So it is extremely sensitive land and it's extremely important that they get this right. The stakes are as high as they have ever been for Andes Petroleum in Ecuador. Unfortunately, it's also going to be extremely hard for them to get this right. And one of the reasons is that this is the poorest area in Ecuador. These graphs, and they may be kind of hard to read for folks in the back, so I'll talk you through them, show some living standards data that I collected uh, from government statistics in the different parts of Ecuador. The gold bars that you see are the national average for each. The green bars are the living conditions in the territories that have current Andes Petroleum and Petro Oriental concessions on them. Finally, the red bars all the way on the right of each category are the living standards in the territory that's about to be incorporated into the new concession. And as, you, and as I promised, let me read across from left to right just in case folks can't see. On the left-hand side, the first three categories are housing amenities. So you go, it goes indoor running water, sewer or septic tank hookup, and electricity. And the two on the right are education, net enrollment rates for primary and secondary students. And as you can see, it's night and day in some of these categories. This parish where the new concessions are is in the bottom percentile, or the bottom few percentiles of the country for each one of these categories. And again, when I was talking to that contact at the embassy in Quito, he told me the other way that Andes Petroleum has created peace with their local communities has been through establishing a, a church here or there, or building a school here or there, maybe paving a road that already existed but hadn't been paved. Um, that is not going to do it here. If you look at those green bars, they may be one church or school building or paved road away from having a significantly different standard of living, but that is not what the need is in these new concessions. We're talking about electricity, running water, and plumbing, and basic health issues. Finally, 
So I've established that it's very important that they get it right, and I've established it'll be difficult to get it right. Here's why we think it's actually going to be impossible to get it right, unless something amazing happens. Ecuador botched the community consultation process that they're required to follow before starting a new oil concession in indigenous territories. Ecuador has very progressive laws on the books about what they have to do in order to have a new uh, extractive a project under indigenous territory. First, there, there are two different sets of standards, environmentally and socially, for a project, depending on the result of community consultation. If the indigenous community rejects a, a project, they can still move forward, but there are higher standards they have to meet in terms of things like hiring indigenous workers, for example, and, and other standards. So how do you know which standard to apply. The government has to find out whether the indigenous community accepts it or rejects it. Unfortunately, there was not a process to take a majority vote or poll or any of those things. There were a few community meetings to inform the community about what was going to happen, but there was never a vote or a poll. Instead, remember I told you there was two indigenous groups living in that territory, the Quichua and the Sapara. The Quichua is much larger than the Sapara. The Sapara is an endangered group, according to UNESCO, for example. Uh, I'm sorry, UNICEF. Um, they got the signature of the person who was the president at the time of the smaller of the two indigenous groups. And then case closed, end of day, that's it, they're moving forward. So not only is that not according to the law, but the indigenous groups are not buying it. They do not, they are not going along with it whatsoever. They're taking their struggle about this globally. And here actually is a picture from last September's climate march in New York City. Uh, here is Leonardo Cerda, a leader of the Quichua people. And here is Gloria Uchigua, the president of the Sapara women, who are now taking their protest about this new concession globally. So I notice that Andes Petroleum hasn't begun work in this concession yet. They haven't done anything wrong yet. They haven't done anything right yet. They've done nothing yet in this concession. And they're already being protested in the streets of New York City. They just went from one of the companies with the best record in the country to being protested internationally, globally, in fact. And it's because Ecuador, the country where it's happening, didn't uphold their own great community standards. So this has major lessons for governments, the importance of setting and enforcing your own standards for civil society, the importance of holding them accountable, because governments are always going to have an incentive to try to streamline new projects to get that revenue. Uh, but in order to go into more detail about those, um, about those policy recommendations, I'm going to hand it back over to Kevin, who will close us out. Okay. I can't read it from here. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of studies, and we talked about, talked about two of them in depth here. But uh, even though China is responsible for the growth and expansion in this sector, the Latin American governments are responsible for the management of their own resources, and they're supposed to be representative of the people that, they, that are in their countries. And we really lay the, the bulk of the blame on Latin American countries for not managing their resources well and not engaging with, uh, with the people in their communities and their countries. And they really uh, need to upgrade their social and environmental standards and be held accountable for them. Uh, some of the major success stories are not necessarily because of government laws on the books, but they're the function of strong civil society pressure to make, hold both governments and foreign companies, uh, foreign companies accountable. Um, one of the things that, that is important, though, that governments can do that somewhat comes out of the Peru case is that, you know, a, 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 an oil company that's operating in China when it moves to Ecuador, it's a totally different totally different situation, totally different ecosystem, totally different uh, way of doing things. And, you know, cases like this, uh, like this spill could be avoided if there's, if there's ex ante kind of engagement about what, what the company might be, uh, might be, uh, might be involved in. We, we also do, however, think that there's a role for the Chinese government and for Chinese firms to play. Uh, Chinese firms and the Chinese government especially um, have, have sort of two legs up in the region. You know, they're really capitalizing on South-South cooperation and not being Western companies and not being uh, funded by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund that are, that are rightly very stigmatized in the region for a lot of work that they did in the 1970s and 1980s uh, where they didn't get any of this stuff, uh, any, any of this stuff uh, right in the, to begin with. So to maintain that image and that, that, that leg up that they have, um, they're really going to have to uh, really have to step up to the plate or they'll quickly 
um, become a target like the World Bank was, like the International Mon Monetary Fund was, um, for global and local campaigns that will quickly just put them uh, in, on a different playing field. It's also rational for the Chinese firms to be doing this to protect their bottom line. Uh, it might be because of the institutions in China that when you think you've got a five-year program that's a project that's going to cost three billion dollars, that it's going to be a five-year project that's going to cost three billion dollars in China. But in Ecuador and Peru, if you've got civil society there stopping you every sense of the day, it could be a ten-year project for fifteen billion dollars. You're not going to make your money. And so, for to protect the bottom line, it's also important for China to upgrade its overseas guidelines, increase the transparency of them make them more diffused. What we find in a number of our studies is interesting guidelines at home, but they don't make it to the project level in the country. Um, and we want the same kind of recommendations uh, for the Chinese policy banks that are often, A, lending money to the, to the uh, Latin American governments that in turn contract many Chinese companies to do this work, and then they're also uh, providing finance to Chinese companies to go and, and do the projects themselves. So they are a key hinge, social and environmental guidelines for the banks themselves could be strengthened and play a better role in the diffusion of this. But the key thing is civil society organizations need to be focusing, A, on the government, B, on the sector as a whole, because what we're finding is that it's not, as it, I hope it's clear that it's, it's, it's not always the Chinese companies, often the, it's not the Chinese companies that are, that are the most egregious. Um, and there are lots of civil society efforts, but they uh, need, to be, need to be heightened, especially at this point when we're, there's this significant downward pressure uh, on the regulations to, uh, in, in the midst of the slowdown. Hopefully we've given you enough uh, provocative things to have a nice discussion over the next a little bit. Thank Big you. applause. Big applause. And again, here's uh, if you didn't get a hard copy on your way in, we've got a couple more. But here's a link. Uh, you can get the report and the uh, all the country studies in English. Uh, the Chinese version is is uh, currently being translated, and we're going to be doing events like this in China later in the summer. And uh, we'll have a full book in Spanish uh, published by the Universidad de Pacifica Press, and we're going to launch that uh, with a different mix of us and different case studies um, in Peru alongside the World Bank meetings in Lima in October. Wow. I mean, I've been putting on meetings for a few years, you know, starting about five years ago people trying to give talks on, you know, Chinese investment overseas. But this is hands down the first comprehensive, comparative, good anecdotes. And so kudos. And I'm very particularly excited that you are going to go to China with this. And who, who, who are you going to talk to? We're going to do a whole bunch of, we're going to do a whole bunch of events. Uh, we're going to do, be part of a workshop between the CAF and the CDB, the, the Latin American Development Bank and the China Development Bank. We're going to do a workshop at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences Institute for Latin American Studies, uh, the World Wildlife Federation, is, or is it the fund there? I get WWF. the F's. Just say know. WWF. Uh, and uh, World Resources Institute and Green Innovation Hub are going to hold a civil society oh, nice. dialogue about these things. Um, so we're going to, we're going to have a lot of fun. So your matchmaking will continue. I'm excited about it. Those folks are all fired up. But. All right, let's, I want to open up to the audience because I can interject. Of course, Hu Tao, I knew he'd be first. That's why he <laughs> sat here. Okay. Susan, do you want to come swooping around? It's Hu Tao from WWF. Take a bunch and. And then we'll, ta we'll take a couple questions. So who wants to be second after that one? After Thank Hu Tao. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, excellent the presentations, uh, excellent job. Uh, so I actually have a lot of questions. I even John, in Ke uh, John and Kevin, Becky, and uh, Cynthia last year in Peru for their interim progress uh, workshop. Yeah, so maybe give us a couple. Yeah, yeah okay. Shorten my, my uh, questions. Actually, first uh, suggestion, Kevin. Earlier you mentioned the points on entry. I found uh, I would suggest to add uh, at least two more. One is uh, the bilateral uh, FTA negotiation. China has already have a FTA with Chile is negotiating with several you know, Latin American countries on free trade agreements. If the two countries have the articles on investment, that would be much better to regulate the companies, Chinese companies' investment in Latin American countries. And even more beyond that, actually, is in WTO. You know, so far, Globally, there is no investment rules at all. So that's a problem. You know, the country goes to another country, 
to have the investment. But uh, we need to be from a global uh, gaggy, from the global economic governance perspective, we need to regulate this investment. So that's, I think, uh, another entry point. And uh, quickly move to my question first to uh, Becky. So very interesting study. The Sandal Pack has different performance in different countries. I should tell you, years ago, I visited the Sandal Pack. The VP who is responsible for the environment issue, a Mal Malaysia guy. He worked before for BP and Shell. The Sandal Pack, I hear him is because he had, he had some experiences in those countries, in Shell and uh, BP. He said, uh, based on my interview with him, the worst country of Sandal Pack environment performance actually is not as the Latin American country. The worst one is Iran, because they have almost no environmental requirement. A second one is China. That was obviously China <laughs> itself. <laughs> so there are some regulations, but not enforced well. Uh, those countries actually is better. <laughs> and he, based on my interview with him, the key message I got is adaptability of Sinopec. He said, uh, which country, no matter which country, the one that requires, we just to do our job. Otherwise, why should we do? We want to save money, save cost, right? So my question to you is, which is more important, those companies as an investor, as a key player, or the re regulators? Which is more, which is matters better, you know, more uh, matters a lot on local environment. So I think uh, do the comparison. Sometimes uh, local governments, they may have some problems, you know, law enforcement issue especially. And uh, Cynthia, I also, you know, I wonder, is Peruvian government where actually the demand of these minerals in China actually is declining because of China's economic restructuring. China is new, new economic structure is going to move to tertiary industry rather than manufactured. That means in the future, coal mines and coal miners and uh, the oro, the, those are all gradually declining in China. So at that time, I guess you're going to talk about uh, India, Latin American you know, investment issue. Uh, India is competing China's iron and steel industry. And China, opposite, is going to move more manufactured industries, maybe to Latin Americans too. At that time, you're going to talk about maybe China's textile industry, China's uh, electronic, electrical industries, and environment problem in Peru. As this, we call it, this is the second wave of the China's investment. We're writing a report on that. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, and we'll gather one question from here. Well, uh, so my understanding... Well, can you tell us to who you are? I'm sorry. I'm from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Okay. Uh, my understanding of your presentation is that both the host countries in South America and the Chinese companies should be blamed for, uh, for this kind of story. So is it uh, true that my understanding is, uh, is right or not? And... Uh, well, this question is quite uh, quite similar uh, to my colleagues. Uh, okay, and the second question is compared with uh, the so-called non-Chinese companies. How would you say that uh, the Chinese companies are doing a better job or or no? Okay. And then uh, uh, so so uh, just uh, tell President Xi Jinping what China should do. I think I think we have to stop with that because you have to be okay. You've Here, let me, how do you want to divvy it up I there? Touch on uh, free trade agreements and um, and points of entry. Talk about uh, talk about that. You know, um, I'd be very reluctant to encourage Latin American governments to um, push investment components of their treaties with the Chinese because the Latin American governments already, most of them already have uh, investment treaties with the United States and they're going to want to mimic that kind of language to make them consistent. And the ones with the United States are deeply flawed uh, and a huge issue of controversy not only in, in Latin America but, uh, but also here in, 
in the United States. Uh, they outlaw the ability. You know, they outlaw the ability of co countries to do these uh, local build local link linkages. Uh, have some of the progressive policies uh, related to uh, labor. Uh, they make it very difficult to upgrade your environmental standards. And the hinge that that is the most worrisome is that the investment parts of the agreements aren't governed by the nation states and the regulators. They're actually governed by the foreign companies, and they've. Uh, created a number of loopholes through these um, that allowed the foreign firms and these private tribunals to interpret new environmental laws as uh, things they didn't expect, and therefore the new costs are almost like expropriations. And the, the top of the list uh, on, on Cynthia's list of the most egregious companies in, in Peru of uh, uh, in terms of environmental uh, regulations is a company called Do, Do Run from the United States, and they're using the U.S.-Peru free trade agreement to put real downward pressure and to try to sue the, the Peruvian government on these. Now, the Chinese had a different model. Well, this is one thing I would say to, uh, to Xi Jinping. The Chinese had a different model for, of investment treaties that they signed with the Germans, that they've signed with other countries over the past 10 years. But now they're engaged in a treaty negotiation with the United States, and the United States is pushing really hard to get these Peru-like provisions. And I'd encourage the Chinese to push back. Um, Chinese institutions themselves at home are not, as str not strong enough to hold up to this kind of pressure from U.S. companies. And uh, it'll be a real tough thing in the region. Uh, for the Chinese, and it, it, in, 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 in it would allow the, the laggard Chinese firms, because our message is not that Chinese firms are to be, and there's leaders in laggards, right? And you look at the, at the uh, traditionally, Shogong has been a laggard in the, in the region, but it, uh, to date, Chinalco has been a leader. But you create the loopholes, the laggards can win the day through these kinds of investor state dispute settlements. So I, I'm very concerned about that. I think a better forum is the new CELAC Latin America Forum that was just created in, uh, in January 8th and 9th in the document, in the major five-year cooperation plan that's going to have its next, uh, its next uh, summit in, in 2018 in Chile. They have four or five different negotiating areas on climate change, on engaging with the local communities on natural resources, uh, on dealing with water issues, and on dealing with communities. And I think that's a better south-south way to deal with this thing these kinds of issues in a diplomatic way rather than a punitive way where private corporations can sue companies, sue countries directly uh, for, the, for, the, for trying to upgrade and deal with these issues in a sound manner. Uh, I'll start with your question, actually. What we see in the oil case studies specifically is that the difference between Chinese investors and other investors is that the Chinese investors in oil companies tend to be either publicly owned or receiving financing through a Chinese publicly owned policy bank, which have public policy goals. Either way, there's often a twofold goal from the Chinese investor standpoint. One of them is economic. They're in it for the money, like any other oil company. And the other one is diplomatic, having a long-term relationship where they know they can have a secure source of that resource over the long term. And what that means is that creates the sense of, as Hu Tao said, adaptability that we see in the record of Sinopec, for example. That Wherever your standards are set, high or low, Sinopec will meet them. They may not exceed them, and they may not meet them out of the goodness of their hearts, but if that's what it takes to maintain the long-term relationship that they're looking for, then that's what they'll do. And that does set them apart from some of the other oil companies that we have seen, especially in the case of Ecuador, where uh, Andes Petroleum and Petro Oriental in inherited their concessions from Oxy, who was run out of the country for not fulfilling their commitments, for not living up to the local standards. So I'm not ready to say that Chinese companies always outperform their competitors by any stretch of the imagination. But where there are standards that are upheld and enforced and communicated, and Sinopec or P CNPC or Sinook, any of the big Chinese oil companies know that the long-term relationship hinges on their ability to meet those standards, that that's important to them because they're in it for the long haul. So that's the difference. And I think it creates a really great opportunity for Latin American governments because that gives you a tremendous amount of leverage to enforce your own standards. You don't have to be afraid that you're going to run off the investors because the Chinese investors are in it for the long haul when it comes to oil companies. 
Um, so this brings me to your question of which is more important, the state or the company, in determining whether they're going to fulfill these obligations. As I said, um, the oil companies in Ecuador, the Chinese oil companies, inherited it from Oxy, who was run out for not doing it. So their willingness to do what it takes to stay in this long-term relationship is, is a crucial part of the equation, absolutely. But what it comes down to at the end of the day is whether the state has communicated it very clearly to the company involved that our long-term relationship depends on your ability to meet these standards. And so there is in very, I'm not willing to say like, this one will always trump that one. Both of these things have to happen. But the fact that they're dealing with Chinese state-owned enterprises gives Latin American company, countries the ability to be the important actor in a way they might not be able to in other relationships. Okay, I want to respond to, to both questions as well. Um, I, I want to also mention briefly the, the free trade agreement question um, because in the case of Peru, Peru negotiated a free trade agreement with the United States and then one with China, and they were dramatically different in terms of the negotiations around these issues. With the United States, it was long and painful and contested, and it had to go through U.S. Congress, and issues of a conservation and environment were fundamental. I remember you, members of U.S. Congress really pushing for, you know, mahogany provisions and, and you know, deforestation and, and everything else. Uh, and the Peruvians came out of that exhausted, but feeling a number of civil society folks in Peru, some of them were here today, felt that that free trade agreement uh, allowed for these issues to be on the agenda, that the U.S. was the good guy in, in helping include them. However, the level of enforcement subsequent to that has been relatively weak. And you have U.S. cooperation with the Ministry of the Environment, helping trying to strengthen some of their capacity, but, but really it's been, it was much more getting to that than actually implementing it, and it's been disappointment. The negotiation with China had none of that on the agenda. It wasn't an issue. And, and the trade negotiators for Peru were quite pleased that they didn't have to deal with the Chinese Congress and Chinese NGOs and, and all these environmental and social issues. And they really focused on trade. And they really focused on how many sectors would be on or off the table or protected. And the Peruvians came out feeling that the free trade agreement with China was all about getting more goods to market and on traditional exports and that kind of thing. So um, I think neither of them have been that effective as they could have been, especially once the negotiations are over. Hutel mentioned that, you know, are, are, are Latin American countries aware that Chinese demand is changing? I think they're vitally and fundamentally aware, if not obsessed by that, that <laughs> issue. And one of the things driving standards downward is precisely, well, if prices are going down and demand is going to go down, the projects that are already committed, mm. you want to get them up and rolling. And if that means reducing the requirements for environmental impact studies or providing, you know, a 60-day limit on getting them approved or in the case of, of Peru, the environmental regulatory agency that sanctions violations is, is not going to be allowed to do so in a series of issues. Um, it's because they're, they're sort of betting on, well, Chinese demand is, is going to go down, but on the other hand, they've committed to, to us in a number of projects that have 20, 30-year lifespans, and we want to make sure they get up and running because they're a big share of our portfolio. Um, the other issue that's sort of there is, well, in the, a number of Western firms are finding projects not as profitable as they looked and thinking of leaving, and maybe the Chinese will come in and buy them cheaper, and we can get them to come in anyway for the long haul. And so um, the way that awareness plays out isn't necessarily um, in the direction one would want in terms of st protecting standards. Um, I really appreciate the question on um, you know, who's responsible on both sides, and I'm, I'm glad it comes from someone from the social science community because we need to research mm -hmm this a lot more, especially in Latin America where there isn't much capacity to do research on China. Um, but I think that on the positive side, one of the advantages of the Chinese is learning from everyone else's mistakes. And to the extent that that's happening and that the Chinese companies are hiring good advisors and doing more due diligence than they did originally. I mean, one of the cases we looked at involved a company that really had no clue what they were getting into. And they believed it when the Peruvian government told them they would resolve all the social issues on the ground and then found out that the government came and went and the social problems were still there in Puta. Uh, and I think that they've subsequently learned from that and, and they have the advantage of, of being more recent. Um, but yes, I think there are disadvantages as well and in, in where the, perhaps um, transnational civil society groups and, and think tanks and others need to work on both sides. Um, because the ability to sort of hold Chinese companies accountable back home is one that many of us don't, don't know much about. And um, we would hope that the Chinese authorities are working with their companies, especially the big state-owned enterprises, 
uh, to comply with these kind of global standards. But it's a whole different ballgame than, say, going to Newmont's shareholder meetings in Boulder, Colorado, or to you know, wherever, um, to try and influence them. So yes, there are important differences that, that need to be understood and, and worked on. So, so Hu Tao, your work is going to be valuable, right? Um, but vital, vital. <laughs> um, we're going to ask another question, but I have to insert one. So how about this woman here, and as you're getting the mic to her, OK. Some, I know Kevin knows this, you two may not, that, that one of my big projects here at the center is called Choke Point China, part of our Global Choke Point Initiative, looking at water energy confrontations. And <clears throat> I was wondering, because I looked at the, you know, when looking at the pie chart, the bar with the water footprint of just the Chinese investment, a lot of it extractive. Chinese trade. Chinese trade. But so I'm curious that if, you know, in, in the industries you're talking about, like maybe they will be meeting the environmental regulations, but what they're dealing with is just a very thirsty industry. Anyone talking on that? And, you know, that, that um, you know, that, because this is a question of embedded water. And it sounds like, you know, uh, Cynthia, you said that, you know, think tanks should get involved in looking at things. I'm like, oh, can I do this stuff? Because I, 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 we want to do like a choke point, another choke point initiative that looks, choke point trade, that looks at embedded water, you know, starting, you know, focusing with Chinese trade, but then going beyond. So. I was kind of curious if you all have been thinking about that. Maybe it's next step. Do you want to take a bunch? And we'll take a couple. Right? Take another question here. Uh, hi, my name is Claudia Mendieta. I'm from the Inter-American Development Bank. And this is a question for Cynthia. Um, I don't know if this makes part of the research, but uh, what could you say about the role of uh, Chinese companies or Chinese uh, investment in informal or illegal mining in a country like Peru where uh, this is very related to this uh, environmental degradation? And this gentleman right here, also on the inside, maybe a little bit of vaulting. Or you can just pass it across. Thank you. Thank you for stunning bits of work. This is great. Um, and, is, and who are you, sir? I'm, yeah, sorry. I'm Tom Cruise. I work with the uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund yes. in New York. Um, my question is, is, maybe it's a little nerdy, but um, <laughs> don't you run the risk of comparing sort of more greenfield new investments with more brownfield tail end investments when you're comparing you know, what Oxy did before and what Sinopec is doing now? First question, and, um, I mean, what about comparing Sinopec now with a new investment from one of the international oil companies? And I wonder how that stacks up. Um, second question is, is Petrobras is arguably, you know, as much about Brazilian foreign policy in some ways as it is about making money. Um, so I'm wondering about the trans-Latin players and the influence of this world that you're describing on them. Did you discover anything? Any thoughts? Do you want more? Yeah. He wants more. We want, we want more. I got the woman there in the blue. Hello, I'm Denise Leung from the World Resources Institute. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have two, two questions. Um, one is, have you looked at all at SMEs in, in Latin America, or have you mainly focused on the, the big SOE players? The second question is, um, this research is really interesting, and I know there's a lot of different groups in D.C. and across the world that have been examining these issues. And I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity pr to present these results to the Peruvian government, to Chinese decision makers, Chinese companies, and what your angle has been when you've, when you've addressed these issues, and I guess what, what you've learned for future research steps from those interactions. More? Sure. Okay, one more. Because you're very good about weaving the answers to all of them together. Thank you. Helps you avoid the hard ones. Hi, I'm Jenny Martinez. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny Martinez from Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I have a couple of just two quick questions. One is, did you find any, of, and I'm really looking forward to reading these reports, and it might be in there, but did you find um, any evidence or were able to quantify what the secondary environmental impacts are in terms of wildlife, illegal wildlife trade, timber, and, and what it's doing, especially because I know that some of these um, mining things are w either within a national park or very close by. And so, and the second question that I had, did you find any examples of a government actually enforcing regulations without civil so society pressure, if they just did it voluntarily? Thanks. Great. Let me take Tom Cruz's and uh, and Denise's and and uh, so. Uh, so Tom, in, in our um, in our case studies, that we're, sometimes we are comparing green and green, sometimes brown and brown. I think I think what uh, what uh, is an important distinction, however, is that the majority of Chinese investments have been mer mergers and acquisitions, and sometimes they've inherited these 
situations that are these legacies from the past that uh, the good news is they've had to learn to them, they've had to meet or beat them, or they're going to get kicked out like the folks before them got kicked out. But like I said at the end, this is the big challenge now is you get these massive infrastructure projects you're going to come across, you're going to have these big greenfield projects which also need infrastructure around them, and this is a whole new set of challenges. You know, as academics, we wanted to create a a uh, body of empirical work on stuff that's actually happened. And so the new Greenfield ones are online, but there's nothing for us to go look at. And so what we've done here is say, here's, here's a whole bunch of cases. Companies have been here since 1992. Companies have been there operating since 2007 and so forth. What's the record here? What can we learn about some of these new things? Um, and it's hard to, you know, most of the Greenfield stuff is, is, is online or hasn't happened yet. In terms of the presentations, uh, this, is, this is the English language launch, launch of the report. So we're here in Washington yesterday. We had a big, uh, uh, I guess they didn't invite you. We had a big, uh, <laughs> um, big, big group yesterday at the Inter-American uh, Inter Development Bank, a good 75 or so people. Uh, today we're here. Tomorrow we're doing a private workshop at the, at the World Wildlife Federation. Um, but uh, we're going to, going to China to do a bunch of these things in uh, in August and September, and then the you know this this is the, the big this is about Latin America, and so we're going to do a lot of outreach in Latin America. And all of these only the policy report is translated into into Chinese, um, but the all the all the case studies um, are going to be available in in Spanish um, and the um, and be published in a, in a book, and we're going to be all over the region uh, talking with folks. Uh, in, in the actual region. When, when, when we had the original workshop and we did the first drafts, we had a symposium where we were very well attended uh, in Peru by members of the embassy. Uh, many of the, uh, one of the, we had one of the CEOs of one of the companies of, uh, that were there. So we, we've engaged with them and embedded with them a little bit throughout, throughout the process. But uh, now we've got set of clear cases that uh, it'll be interesting to, to react. So we'll ans fully answer your question in a, in a couple months. Okay. Folks want to deal with some of the other ones? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, these are good questions. Two of them, about water and about I informal or artisanal mining, are really questions more about the industry more broadly than about China per se. And I think they're, f they're fundamental. I mean, in the region, and, and particularly in the country where I work, um, Water is one of the three or four main sources of social conflict around extractive industries, and particularly in areas where the water is scarce, but also in areas where water quality is, is in concern. And um, there's, there's d disputes over land rights, there's disputes over water quality or supply, there's disputes over jobs, as, as several, several of our cases show, and disputes over what to, how to distribute the revenues. And I think that the, um, it's fundamental to look at water and to look at how companies are addressing um, ways to use water more, uh, to, to use, use water better or use water less. Um, a number of the conflicts in, in the case of um, projects nearer to the ocean are about desalinization and using that water rather than scarce groundwater, and I know there are issues on both sides about that, but I think we need to look at that, and, and the Chinese firms need to be involved, and the Chinese government needs to be involved uh, like the others. Um, Claudia's question, I'm, I'm very pleased to see Claudia here. She's a graduate of our university and used to work at our research center before she came here. Um, and the sort of expansion of what is art, alternatively called informal, artisanal, or illegal mining in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, the rest of the region is a major and, and, and worrisome phenomena. It's called illegal in some times and periods. It's not illegal in others. And in Bolivia, it's been welcomed by Evo Morales in Peru. The Obama administration has decided to militarize the, the you know, and, and illegalize it. Um, but it's an expanding issue in, in general because the uh, large-scale multinational corporations and huge projects are, in, in many cases, not being perceived as providing the kind of benefits that people want. And so you have a lot of, of, of small-scale miners in communities saying, we want to go directly for the gold and get our piece of it too, and it's a social issue, it's a political issue, they fund campaigns, they, they, they elect local authorities, but I would say the Chinese involvement in that is no more, no less than the Russians, the Brazilians, um, and just about everybody else, and the majority of illegal or informal miners are Peruvian and, and very actively engaged in Peruvian politics around this. There is a set of issues related to Chinese immigration in the Peruvian case. Chinese, China, Peru has a large Chinese immigrant population from the past, and from what I understand by the research of other people, not mine, is that um, 
there's been a significant influx of Chinese immigrants coming through Peru, some fortune seekers looking to find gold and some trying to get visas to the U.S. And it's more of an issue of that sort than particularly Chinese presence in the sector. It's a broader social issue. Um, on comparing brown and brown and green and green, um, and on the Petrobras, I agree, Kevin basically answered the question um, well, and I think it's fair to, to put things in their due perspective. Just a comment, in, in the case of Petrobras, I mean, in Peru, the pres presence of Brazilian investors is huge and a huge issue because of the relation to corruption as well as to the environment um, question. Petrobras, however, has just decided to sell out all of its actions in Peru to a Chinese company, to CNPC. And so we now will see <laughs> if the Chinese can do better than the Brazilians um, in, in oil and in, in the Amazon. And that, I think, is the a next round, a second round of research for us. Um, and the issues that, that um, Jenny mentioned from Fish and Wildlife Service, um, I think that is a second round of research we need to be doing, um, looking at different types of activities and looking at these secondary impacts. Um, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do more of that. And just a final answer to your question is absolutely fundamental that civil society organizations are engaged. And uh, I don't think any government has voluntarily implemented and enforced standards, even though some have imported standards due to the free trade negotiations or due to wanting to get back into the international community for credit reasons. And the World Bank has beautiful standards and others have standards that have been imported. But implementing them depends heavily on a number of organizations like those in this room to really be watchdogging all along the way. Thank you. I'll finish up by answering, uh, I think there's four questions that I, I can answer out of this bunch. Um, about water, um, when I was digging into the water statistics to make that chart, what we find the real, like, the huge differences between trade to China versus trade to other partners when with the water footprint is actually the agricultural exporters. is Argentina and Brazil, we're talking about soy plantations in that situation. And the one of the reasons, yes, we know that extractive industries are famous or infamous for tremendous water thirst. One of the reasons that it doesn't show up in the data, however, is that while there's a tremendous amount of water use per ton of output, there's also a tremendous amount of dollars coming out of every ton of output. So the waters per the water per mm -hmm. million dollars of output doesn't show up as being as extreme as it is in agriculture where a ton of soy has, or rather, I'm sorry, a million dollars of soy is a whole lot of tons and a whole lot of water. So the, the regions where we see but but still, I think that looking at it in terms of with dollars as the denominator per, mm -hmm. per million dollars of out of exports is still very useful because from a development planner's perspective, you're looking at where do you want your priorities to be for your for your trade balance? Where do you want planning to go? You know, where do you want to invest a particular amount of money in? And so, if you're investing it, if or if, if you're developing intentionally in a uh, a way that favors plantations, enormous industrial agriculture, uh, especially with soy, you have to take into account the mm -hmm. enormous water there. So there is, a lot of it is the industry. And that's not even an investment situation so much as a trade situation. Mm -hmm. For example, in Brazil, we're talking about large landholders who are Brazilian trading with China. So I still think it's a brilliant question and definitely deserves future research. But I wanted to be able to clarify that detail for you a little bit. Oh, and but with, we can be nerds, too. But with the with the but about the pollution from the extractive industries is that something that you that you're going to dive into later as well like what that because that's another form of water footprint oh it absolutely is and these water footprints that we were looking at combine green blue and gray so they combine <laughs> a little yucky rainbow <laughs> a yeah rainbow of water colors um, green being groundwater blue being rainwater gr gray being pollution like contaminated water that you're leaving behind so okay. it is possible in fact to dig into that data from the water footprint network if you're familiar with their data you can dig into it further and look specifically at the gray water footprint we haven't isolated that but I think it's a gray area for future research and we absolutely should um, I think believe Jenny um, is that did I get your name right? Um, ask about indirect environmental effects. Our Brazilian case study author, uh, his other research has shown really definitively, and a lot of other researchers have shown the same thing, that in the Amazon basin, the number one driver of deforestation is not oil fields, and it's not mines, and it's not plantations. It's the roads to get there. It's the roads to get the products to port. And the reason is, not only do those roads like splinter the Amazon, but they also bring in new communities of people to settle all along those roads, not to widen those slashes through the Amazon, and displace traditional communities who have been there being productive and supporting their communities for generations. 
Um, so that is a major part of our Brazilian case study. It's also a major part of our Ecuador case study because, uh, just as a side note, Sinopec is a minority stakeholder in a Repsol block in Ecuador, Block 16, which is the first block in Ecuador to try roadless development. They call offshore inland development, where you act like it's an offshore platform, except it just happens to be in the Amazon. And you bring all of your people in on airplanes or helicopters. You bring all of your equipment in when you're first setting up on helicopters. It's incredibly challenging, and there's a huge upfront cost. But again, if you're working with a partner who plans on being there for a very long time, that kind of upfront investment becomes more justifiable from a corporate standpoint. So it's... Our, one of our policy recommendations is that if Andes Petroleum is going to move forward with these concessions, then they consider some of these alternative ways of doing it because the indigenous concerns, you know, the indigenous leaders in that area that I've spoken to and that my co-authors have spoken to, what they want more than anything is just to be left alone. And offshore inland is the only way you could possibly come close to leaving the surrounding communities alone. And also the only way you can limit the amount of actual deforestation that happens in its wake. Kelly Swing is a Boston University expert, uh, by, uh, ecologist who's based in the Amazon in Ecuador actually has a center there. And he has been a longtime advocate for offshore inland development for the future concessions that are happening. And this leads a little bit into Tom's question about greenfield projects. These greenfield projects that we're looking at are so new over and over again. So we see Chinese companies have learned with mergers and acquisitions. There's been a learning curve. And now they're beginning to take steps into greenfield projects. And that's where things are about to get really complicated and difficult, because they're going to have to deal with problems that they never had to deal with before. They're gonna have to deal with much more investment up front that they ever had to deal with before, questions they never had to answer. Offshore inland isn't an option when you're inheriting a concession that already has roads, for example. Um, they have to deal with local communities who've never had oil exploration or mining in their midst before and might not want it, and they've never had to deal with that before. And of course, the biggest greenfield project by far, it swamps all other Chinese greenfield investment for the last five years combined, is the Nicaragua Canal. That is Construction began on that the day before Christmas Eve, a few months ago. So we have very little data so far on the impacts of it because it's just beginning. We can, it wasn't in time to include in this study, but we absolutely think that infrastructure is going to be, and, and infrastructure is really where you see the greenfield difference with Chinese investment, well over half. Uh, I mean, well over half in the last five years is just the Nicaragua Canal, frankly, but something like 80% of the last five years or something is in new infrastructure projects, just in the greenfield projects. So that is going to have massive community issues, massive environmental issues. As I already established, infrastructure and deforestation, enormous connections. So absolutely is going to be worth looking into in our next round of projects. But unfortunately, there isn't really enough uh, information on the ground yet to look at it in kind of a post hoc academic way. Um, let's see, what else am I looking for? Oh, your question about Petrobras was so great. What a great, like, let's compare apples to apples question. Uh, I can tell you what my impressions are after reading through a ton of oil history in the region. I haven't looked at the study, at Petrobras's performance sp specifically, directly, intensively. What I can tell you is they have had a much more volatile history in terms of buying and selling different their interests in different concessions around the region. So yes, it represents foreign policy, but it doesn't represent the same attitude of, we are going to use this concession for our supply of X for the next 20 years. They, rather, we're going to be perhaps, we've made a policy decision to be present in this country, perhaps, in one way or another. And then we may change our mind and pull back like they did in Peru. But it might be through a little bit of various concessions. They may come and go and flow in and out of different concessions. But that is very different at a bargaining table where you're saying, you're going to be in this concession for the next 20 years. Here's what we need from you. Um, it creates a very different dynamic for enforceability of local standards. So I'm not trying to put Petrobras down in comparison, but it creates a different dynamic with the local government. Um, there may still be a lot of leverage that local governments can use because it's a government-to-government -government negotiation, but it's not quite the same thing, just my impressions from looking at the oil histories. And then finally, Denise, your question about SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, most of the case studies that we looked at are big projects, especially with mining, what you tend to see, if I'm, if I'm not quoting you wrong here, is juniors discover a deposit and then foreign companies come in and, and take it over and develop it. Um, but if you look at our, so we haven't done that kind of direct comparison because um, it's not always appropriate, like in the case of mining, for example. But if you look at our Bolivia case study, that is a case study of mining with a much smaller private, not state-owned, 
a Chinese mining company, the Zhongyi Mining Company, and uh, their joint venture with a local mining cooperative in Bolivia. Now, mining cooperatives in Bolivia are given advantageous tax status. They're given various advantages. Uh, and having a joint venture, of course, is going to pave the way for learning the local conditions and what's necessary to be successful. So I'd encourage you to look at the Bolivia study for at least one example of a successful SME situation, or more successful than some of its counterparts. Are you, are you, are you realizing that these guys are brainstorming a lot of your Potentially next study steps. This is Great. Awesome. We welcome the competition. Okay, some other questions. And the We're checks. And the checks, yes. We're going to gather. Okay, in the very back. Okay, how about the gentleman at the table and then the person waving like crazily in the back row? Uh, Ken Meyercord, World Docs. What is the role of China in uh, Latin American agriculture? Is it restricted to simply buying agricultural products or is a Chinese agribusiness moving in and taking over land and uh, perhaps converting? Uh, land uh, that was used to food, produce food crops to producing non-food crops for export like flowers or biofuels uh, or if they don't haven't taken over it is is there an influence in that direction okay and then the back row and stand up so we can see you because yeah hi thank you I'm Cynthia Rush with executive intelligence review um, you mentioned Kevin is that your name yeah, yeah hi. Um, that you thought that the Chinese had a leg up uh, on us, I guess. And I would say um, not only do they have a leg up, they probably have two legs up and two arms and a head and a body up. Um, <laughs> because of the magnitude of Chinese involvement and invested, uh, investment in Latin America, which I think is quite breathtaking. Um, and you mentioned the, uh, the Nicaragua Canal. Um, I would disagree that the issue here is environmental impact and in indigenous communities. Um, my publication did an interview with Dr. Telemaco Talavera, who's the spokesman for the Interoceanic Canal, who discusses in great detail the fantastic benefits of this project in terms of job creation, economic development, infrastructure development related to the canal. I have with me if people are interested. But you see in the whole continent um, enormous infrastructure investment well beyond the uh, extractive industries that you mentioned. Uh, railroad construction, nuclear energy, scientific agreements, satellite, uh, aerospace. The agreements China signed with Argentina are quite impressive. Um, and to me, this represents a whole new development paradigm. I think the Chinese view the canal rightly as an extension of the new Silk Road uh, going into the Americas. And um, I think it's absolutely the case that the IMF and the World Bank have been left in, in the dust on this uh, in terms of what they're offering. You mentioned the CELAC China Forum, which included every nation uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, minus the United States and Canada. And the U.S. has is really, at this point, excluded itself from these fantastic developments. So I just wanted to see if you have any comments on that. Okay. Take another qu couple questions. Oh, you stunned them. Oh, wait, there she is. All right. Hi, uh, Yi Ting Wang, consulting for WWF in China. Um, thanks again for the great panel, and I get to see many of you hearing twice, and it's just still not enough. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think you've shown us a lot of variations of governance responses within Latin America. Um, and then, and they're quite vulnerable or, or dependent upon external economic conditions and domestic political constituencies. Um, so I'm wondering if you have just you know a few key points of, or key ingredients for having durable governance structures that could counter some of these economic pressures and and and, um, and individual company performance that really much depends on what locals demand and what locals demands have, you know, is, is a factor of a lot of different pressures. Thank you. Okay. This side of the room, you were active before. Anyone? This side, anyone? All right. Let me, let me quickly answer the first question, but, but predicated by, I guess we're getting, you know, speculative about your, your question from the executive. Uh, executive Intelligence Review. Review. Yeah, you know, thanks for the question, but I, I, I'll ju I just want to say that my remarks are my on my own remarks as a, as an American researcher, one of the only American researchers on this project, and we don't we don't deal with that larger geopolitical Latin America U.S. 
issue in the study. These are fine-grained empirical studies on Chinese uh, trade and investment in the region. So this is this is my take that I, I, I I'm not sure any of my colleagues would 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 necessarily share, but my, my personal take is that the United States has completely neglected the region um, and taken it for granted for the past, you know, for, for decades. Um, we've quote unquote pivoted to Asia uh, when we haven't been mired in the Middle East, and we, um, we've had a very patronizing relationship with the Latin Americans for a long time. Where where we tell them what we think is right for their economies, we tell them what's right for the way that they should organize their uh, organize their institutions, and once they do with what we say, as as uh, as Cynthia has shown out, we leave, um, and then blame them for not implementing the kind of stuff that they do the the next time around, um, and I'm I'm highly critical of that on a lot of on a lot of levels, but when you look at the data, it's not. A, I would not say that it, we're talking about five legs up or three legs up or whatever you said. You know, the the, the United States is still the the number one trading partner with the entire region, although although uh, it has just moved to number two for South America. Uh, for Mexico and North America, it's all about I mean, Mexico and Central America. It's all about the United States. Uh, it completely dwarfs foreign direct investment uh, in Latin America from Chile to. Uh, to Mexico. Uh, yes, the Chinese foreign direct investment is the fastest growing, and it's really the largest presence in these extractive sectors, but, uh, but U.S. FDI is much bigger. Where the U.S. is far, far behind is on finance, right? The Chinese policy banks are financing Latin American governments more than the World Bank, more than the Inter-American Development Bank, more than the CAF on an annual basis. And what's ironic to me to criticize my own government is that in this environment, on June 30th, there's a huge movement in Congress to get rid of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, which was passed by the Roosevelt administration in, uh, 81 years ago, precisely because of Latin America. The Roosevelt administration was really worried about the infiltration of the Germans in Latin America. Um, and they wanted to prop up Latin American governments so they weren't taken over. Latin American governments were really into industrialization at the time. And so the Republican Party and the in U.S. business interests in the United States, led by Nelson Rockefeller, actually convinced the Roosevelt Institute administration to double the budget for Latin America because they'd be able to sell capital exports. And now the same party is, getting, is trying to get rid of this, uh, this institution at exactly the time where China is coming in. And so we... Uh, I'm very encouraged by what uh, by our Cuba policy and some of our immigration murmurings, um, but we have a much long, much further way to go. Uh, that said, like Hu Tao t talked about, the Chinese economy is in the middle of a, of a significant transformation, which is going to be a very shaky one, especially if you look at the at the way Latin America tried to move from industrialized, investment-led growth towards more consumer growth. Every country in the region had a big financial crisis because they liberalized their financial sector too early. Uh, is that going to happen with China? It's very, very tenuous. And as China moves to a consumption-based economy, they're not going to want as much of this stuff. Um, and the Latin Americans don't have anything else to sell it to the Chinese. So that's the other reason why they're panicked. And uh, at the end of the day, that's why Dilma Rousseff is uh, doing everything she can to get here in June, because the United States still is the largest uh, export destination and still is the uh, the largest FDI, and I, I hope we can take these small steps forward with Cuban immigration and, and reform our economic policy towards the region. You know, the Washington consensus is dead everywhere except for in Washington and in Mexico City, and uh, <laughs> we need to we need to treat the region as a partner um, and realize that they know how to manage their economies and uh, take away some of these loopholes that we have in some of our trade treaties and re-up our finance to the region and engage with these folks as partners, because that's what China's doing with CELAC, and it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not an unconscious effort that the United States isn't part of it. There was a question, the ag question. The ag question. So we, uh, we have one study in our, in our report on ag, on, uh, on soybeans in, uh, in Brazil. Um, there's a study that's about to come out by the Inter-American Dialogue by Margaret Myers on uh, Chinese foreign direct investment in the Latin American agricultural sector. It's very comprehensive. It's been going through peer review for about two years. And the punchline is um, uh, it's, it's, it's as overblown as it is in Africa, right? There's, there's land grabs in Africa. There's land grabs in uh, 
uh, in Latin America, but uh, the Chinese are not the, dri not the driver of it. But they are incre increasing their presence in certain sectors in certain countries. But we, we didn't do it. I, the author's name is Margaret Myers. I think it's going to be released in the next couple of weeks. It's a, the, the first and only detailed, d both data and interview-based uh, analysis of the whole thing. Uh, we couldn't do it justice by talking about it here. I'd like to speak to the last question um, on sort of how to prevent these things coming and going with either the winds of macroeconomic global global economy or, or political change in each country. And, you know, I'm a political scientist, and the, the amount of work on how to create and maintain institutions is sort of an a ongoing industry, and it's very hard to do in developing countries. Um, and, and I think it's absolutely fundamental, this question. I mean, coming from countries where, uh, particularly for in the environmental area, the lack of strong, legitimate institutions to regulate, to prevent environmental degradation or to regulate the impact of, of activities that are dangerous to the environment. Um, very few countries in the region have, have managed to do that. And, and a country like Peru is very, very recent and very, very fragile. And I think it's absolutely fundamental. And I think it, it, it's a combination of working with those public sector agencies that are really trying. I mean, in the case of Peru, it's the Ministry of the Environment, which is the, the Peruvian minister is coming up, I think, next week to speak at the um, Inter-American Dialogue and sort of hanging in there against the pressure from all different sides to try and create some institutional capacity that can last beyond one government. And I think that's really important to the extent that, that international development agencies and allies can support that. I also would make a plug for my own sector, which is academia, um, the need, <laughs> the, well, we pass the hat, but the need for expertise in Latin America on issues related to the environment and on issues related to China is both, in both cases, glaring. Um, we really need more experts who don't work for industry, who can work in academia, who can work in universities, work in the public sector. Um, people understand the nuances and, and have international experience with how these issues have been dealt with elsewhere. And particularly people who know something about China, um, we've been trying to recruit a, a China specialist at my university in one of nine different departments and have not been able to do so. Um, because to every, every time we find work. somebody, they go to work for industry or they stay in the US or Europe. And uh, we'll talk to you about that later. But yeah. really creating expertise, capacity in institutions that last that are not involved in the political turnover. And, and, and finally, and very important going back to your question, the same would say for non-governmental organizations in, in these fields, particularly environment, but I would also say human rights, indigenous rights. We have a couple in the room here um, representing organizations in Ecuador and Peru. To the extent that they are linked with academic and policy experts, to the extent that they have international exposure and networking and can compare, for example, Sinopec in different countries or how you've dealt with these issues in different countries, it's also fundamental, um, and I think there's a real role for sort of international um, cooperation with each of these. Thank you. Um, my um, good friend Isabel Hilton from she created China Dialogue. You know that, that's one. It's it, it's now trilingual, and they're up there in Peru, and I, which raised the question of um, journalists, the news media in Latin America, and reporting on this issue. Because I mean, China, do you guys know China Dialogue? If you don't know, if you're the Latin America program, people are like, huh, you guys, you got it in your own language now. It's an amazing um, online news media organization that started in London and then in China. It was, it's fully bilingual in China. And it's, report, it's not only telling stories about what's happening in China with a lot of Chinese authors, but it's also getting bigger stories of, of climate change. But the, the demand, you know, they saw an, a need in Latin America, and, you know, and I'm really excited that the you know the foundations that supported them to do this. But so, what about the news media? Is it? I mean, you hear you hear examples. You know, I mean, we get reports about the protests, but more nuanced investigative reporting. Do we? Is that kind of going on on these topics? You want to speak to that? <laughs> um, You're in country. Yeah, I have I have one tiny anecdote to add to that, and then I want to turn it over to Cynthia. The tiny anecdote that I have to add to that about the news media, and yes, do check out China Dialogue. It's awesome. fantastic. Um, this report is the front page story today. <laughs> A China dialogue. Woo -hoo. Yay. Um, is the situation of, of Sinopec in Argentina with the, the aqueducts and wells that they were supposed to have dug a couple of years ago. And they finally did it only after local media really kept putting up pictures of drought-stricken areas that didn't have them. So crucial partner, um, but my work hasn't shown it to be the driver, but also a crucial partner. There could be capacity issues of yeah. the journalists. I mean, lo at the local level, media in, in Latin America, a number of countries is really under siege. 
by governments, both left and right, um, in Ecuador, in Argentina, uh, but also in, in Peru. Um, independent media reporting, particularly on issues of environmental damage or conflict, and also on issues of indigenous rights and the right to prior consultation, have found themselves in a great deal of trouble from governments that don't like that. Um, perhaps Ecuador is one of the worst cases in which I think the president just doesn't want to hear bad news from, <laughs> from independent media. But they really need to be supported, um, particularly those that do investigative work. And um, you know the international reporters that come to Peru, I get called all the time, and I, I'm, I'm by no means a China expert. I'm really working on extractives more broadly. But the amount of reporters from international media that call us up and ask about you know, the Chinese presence in Peru, but really they uh, once and again, over and over, report a kind of superficial story on Shogang and their labor troubles. And every year Shogang has strikes, and every year they do a story, maybe on the Chinalco relocation, which has been pretty dramatic and, and interesting. But, but we also don't see international media doing a lot of in-depth investigative reporting on these issues, sort of coming back and seeing what's happening after the scandal or after the conflict. So yes, media I would add to the list of folks we need to work with. And, and All right. Um, we're setting the agenda here. <laughs> Knowledge for action, people. Um, just got a couple minutes. Is your last chance, or we just let them go? Oh, there she is. Please grab a mic. Thank you for the presentation. I think it's a great opportunity for learn and to share. Uh, I, uh, and and who are you? <laughs> My name is Paulina Garzón. I work with the China Latin America uh, Sustainable Investments Initiative. It's a brand new initiative established here in Washington. But we are working with different partners in the region. So I think the next question, or one more question for your next research that is looking uh, back to the big picture. What are the, the chances that the environmental and social issues are going to be a priority in the strategic relationship between China and Latin America in the future? Do you want to grab that question? Because we're yeah, um, none of us are Chinese, but um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, I think the big U.S. mistake on the Asian Infrastructure Bank can be leveraged to use uh, to our to our advantage. Um, and the World Resources Institute is going to have a whole workshop about this on Friday. But the Asian Infrastructure Bank is going to have a, a very high level of social and environmental standards because of the spotlight that it's now been put on it and because of the actors that are now sitting at the table, not the United States. And I think a challenge is going to be, uh, let's make sure, we have to make sure that this isn't an exception, right? And there's a difference between safeguards and investment, right? You know, there, there, there are some investments that you just shouldn't be doing. Um, and that's not necessarily going to happen with the Asian Infrastructure Bank. But when they do do them, I think, uh, you know, if you look at the inside of how some of these things are starting to work now, that one is going to be more interesting than we thought in November. Um, but is that going to be isolated, right? The, the China Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank um, do not have great records in the region, and they're ginned up to do these massive projects. Um, to what extent can some of these innovative things that might happen at places like the Asian Infrastructure Bank or that a particular project might learn in, in, in Rwanda or in Iran or in Peru, how, how does this stuff get diffused? Because what the Chinese are engaged in right now, no country's ever globalized at this level of GDP per capita in the history of the world. And they are engaging in countries with higher levels of standards, with different levels of demographic, uh, uh, and demo demographics, different levels of democracy, and it's a huge learning experience for them. And they're learning a lot. Um, but the question is, to what extent can the learning process be diffused in a more rapid level? Because we're living in a world where we still got half the people in poverty, and that uh, is in the middle of a climate bomb. And so, unfortunately, with uh, you know, China should be welcomed for this incredible growth miracle that they've had. But we're in a context where we've uh, we've set the stage, which uh, we have to be very, very careful about every new economic dollar of output in the world. And so, can we accelerate the learning experiences that are happening on the ground? At the project level in Africa or in Peru? Can we accelerate any positive developments that might happen at the Asian Infrastructure Bank? And not only through the Chinese institutions. There's a downward pressure at places like the World Bank as well. Um, and we've, we've, got a, we've got a lot of work ahead of ourselves as, as academic researchers, as the business community, as, and as civil society, which is really at the, at the, at the front lines of all, of all this stuff. And so, um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, the, the Chinese presence is a, 
uh, only increases that. Well, we're coming to the end of that time. I hear the stomach's rumbling, but before you zip off, I mean, first of all, another round of applause for these speakers. And I'm particularly happy because my prediction at the beginning, I know now that I'm going to work with the Latin America program more. because they, they left. I mean, just, just, she's scared. I'm, I'm not going to take you over there. Um, but that, 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 you know, this is, this is an issue that greatly interests me. Glad to hear that there's a China-Latin America. I didn't know this. Come meet me. Um, but for those of you who are Latin America program participants, if you're interested in China, we do meetings, out publications, also matchmaker around China energy and environment. And on um, April 28th, our next meeting is actually going to look at Chinese clean energy investment in the United States and vice versa, another part of the Americas. But so if you need to, if you need to you know, improve your, your muscle on China, I um, hope you join our, our forum. I want to thank the Luz Foundation, Blue Moon Fund, Energy Foundation, and all the other great folks in my mafia that support our work. Thanks so much. I need to talk this as well. Yeah. Was it my, my star student? Yeah. I didn't know she was working at the bank. Hey, Tom. Just like me knows. yesterday. I mean, I can, can I get your card? Yes, please.